Um, we're going to get started. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we have an exciting uh, webinar uh, with Hadi Parchovi, uh, founder of Code.org. Uh, it is a wet and dreary day here in DC. Hopefully, uh, the weather's a little better uh, by all of you. Um, and today uh, would have been day two of the K-12 National Forum in San Antonio. Uh, Hadi was slated to speak as a uh, plenary panelist on day one, uh, but we're grateful that he's here to spend some time with us virtually uh, in the absence of, of, of the National Forum. Uh, just, I'm gonna run through a few housekeeping notes and then uh, we'll get started. So um, uh, just uh, Hadi's gonna run through a brief presentation outlining uh, the founding mission uh, overview of code.org's uh, offerings, uh, both on the curricular side uh, as well as well as other things. Um, and then I'll have a couple of questions uh, of my own, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A. I ask if you do have questions, uh, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen um, uh, as opposed to the chat, and me, my colleagues and I will kind of collate those and, uh, and then post them to Hadi as they come in. Um, and so with that said, Hadi, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here and thank you for inviting me to join. Um, I was asked to spend uh, about 15 or 20 minutes to talk about the work of Code.org first before we go to the Q&A. So I have a few slides I wanted to share. I'm gonna try to share my screen to see if this uh, works okay. If, if there's any problems, please let me know. Uh, can you, Pat, can you see my screen okay? Yep, looks Slides. good. All right, so I wanna talk about computer science in general, uh, and the, which it relates to the work of code.org, and then I'm sure during the Q&A we'll get to talk about the COVID pandemic and the work that we're doing in the context of that. Uh, my story starts, uh, you know, the, the story of code.org starts with my own childhood. I was, uh, I'm a twin, <laughs> this is me and my twin brother when we were growing up. And when I was very young at this age, uh, my country, which was Iran, I lived in Iran, and the country turned into an Islamic state with a revolution and a war broke out with the neighboring country. It was a terrible place to grow up because I spent every single evening in the basement while our neighborhood was getting bombed. Uh, pretty much one of the worst places to grow up as a, as a young boy. But my life completely changed one day when my parents brought home a magical gift. Uh, they gave my brother and I a Commodore 64 computer, and uh, this wasn't the magical gift because we didn't have any software, didn't have any games or apps. The magical gift was actually a book, an introduction to basic programming, and my mom and dad, my mom was a computer scientist, my dad was a physicist, and they together helped teach my brother and I how to become really good at, at computer science and coding. And in fact, when we came to the United States as Iranian immigrants, we, my brother and I both were way ahead of most students at technical skills. And I was able to start working as a summer intern, even though my family was poor, I started working as an intern at tech companies when I was 15 years old, way before, uh, you know, at a time when most of my fellow students would work as babysitters or in restaurants or at gas stations. Uh, I basically have had the opportunity to, to build an entire career in technology. And I've had uh, the good fortune of effectively benefiting from the rise of technology in, in America's economy and in the entire world economy. And as I've been doing this, one thing uh, we've all seen, but I've seen very firsthand is technology's impact on our workforce and the, how the opportunity to sort of get into the best lines of work is not even in this country. If we look out in the next uh, few decades, we all know that technology is changing our work or workforce. And if you consider the jobs that exist today, they are gradually getting automated by computing devices. Most people predict that roughly half of all work is gonna be automated within the next 30 years. That doesn't mean that there won't be work, it just means that there's gonna be new types of work uh, as sort of current types of work get increasingly automated by robots or machines or machine learning. Uh, so what's the new type of work gonna look like? Uh, it's very clear that advanced computing skills are increasingly important, not just in tech industries, but across all industries. In fact, uh, you don't need a crystal ball to look and see where things are going. You just need to look a few years back and compare them. Uh, and if you look at the sort of the pie chart or the, the sort of breakdown of work in this country, the fastest growing sector of work is in highly digital jobs that are the best paying. 
This is jobs, not just like computer programmers or cybersecurity experts, but financial analysts, you know, jobs that work with technology or data. The next fastest growing sector of jobs in this country are moderately digital jobs. And then the shrinking sector of jobs are completely non-digital jobs. At this point, even being a farmer is a digital job. Today's farmers need to know how to update the software on their, on their tractor trailers and start thinking about tractor trailers that need to be programmed because they're self-driving. Uh, now, I led with talking about opportunity and jobs because the work of code.org is in computer science and most people, when they think of computer science and education, the first thing they think about is we need to teach this because that's where the jobs are going. That's one part of the message of code.org, but there's a completely different message that has nothing to do with opportunity or jobs or the future. And it has to do with computer science making school better for what you think school is for. So if you think about what is school for, you don't necessarily think I'm sending my kid to third grade so that they get a job or I'm sending my kid to seventh grade so they get a job. If you ask a seventh grader why are they in school, they're not thinking about their future careers. They're 12 years old and just want to make friends and, and they're going to school because their parents sent them there. Uh, but if you think why we send kids to school, part of it is to just get them better preparation for life regardless of their career. And when I was in school, every school would teach about how the digestive system works, how electricity works, about basic geometry, not because you wanted to get a job as a surgeon or biologist or as an electrician, but just to get an understanding, a well-rounded understanding of how the world works. And in this century, it is equally important for every student to have a basic understanding of how an algorithm works or how the internet works. Again, whether you want to go into technology or not, just to have a well-rounded education. The other reason we send students to school is preparation for college uh, and to basically, you know, get on a pathway of career, no matter what career they want to get into. And what's really interesting in the last few years, there's now six different studies that show that students who study computer science outperform in reading, writing, math, and science as early as elementary school. They outperform in problem solving and executive functioning skills. They perform better in high school math courses. They're 17% more likely to enroll in four-year colleges. They also outperform in problem solving in university. And lastly, they make higher wages after graduation. And this has nothing to do with whether you get jobs in tech or whether there's growth in tech jobs. It literally is saying that the students that study computer science are more likely to go to college. They do better at the other subjects that, that, that school is teaching. And this is really shocking because uh, many of these studies actually involve randomized control tests where you literally take the same group of kids and split them in two. One group is studying math and science. The other group is learning coding and computer science. And then after a few weeks, you compare them and you see that the students that were learning coding and computer science advanced faster than the students who were taking a more traditional uh, education program. And that's something that educators should think about regardless of what the job atmosphere is going to look like just in our goals as educators. The other thing that's super surprising is a study recently came out that language skills are eight times more likely to predict success in computer science than math skills. This breaks a lot of stereotypes. I've spent uh, probably my whole life dealing with the stereotype that if you're good at math, you're good at computer science. If you're good at math, you're gonna be good at coding. That's for the math nerds. Uh, it turns out if you're really good at languages, uh, it's eight times more likely to predict your success in computer science and your ability to learn computer programming. And meanwhile, uh, we have a lot of language teachers who don't realize that that's actually something that, that, that their natural skills align with or language learners, bilingual kids should be more naturally able to learn computer programming and computer science. And that's not necessarily what people's stereotypes lead them towards. The third reason computer science is great for making school better in general is it's more engaging for students and teachers. Again, regardless of what career you wanna go into, uh, this next slide is a little bit controversial. This is a, a slide of the most popular ever TED talk with over a hundred million views by Sir Ken Robinson asking, do schools kill creativity? And most school teachers would not like to, to talk about this because they feel like that a lot of the work that they do is creative, but clearly this is a message that resonates and people wonder why aren't we teaching more creativity in schools? Certainly in the workplace, employers demand more creativity and collaboration 
out of their employees and they complain that schools are sort of teaching to the test and not as much teaching creativity. If you want to teach students creativity, one of the best ways is with computer science because it's naturally creative. By elementary school, students learn how to make beautiful art using code. By middle school, they can make their own games. By high school, they can make their own apps. And in fact, as a result of this, when you survey students, they themselves rank computer science, their favorite subject behind only dance, music, and art. Basically, the, the top three subjects are dance, music, and art. Number four among their favorites is computer science. And that's because of the creativity. Uh, in the words of one uh, eighth grade science teacher, they said, I, I decided to try code.org and teaching computer science in my eighth grade class. And I have never ever seen my students so engaged and so excited about learning as they saw as I saw them today. And this is a reason to teach computer science again, independent of job opportunities. The challenge that code.org is trying to solve is that most schools don't teach computer science. It's just not even offered on the menu. And what's much more inequitable in this country, in, a, in the land of opportunity, is that the likelihood that your child has the even option to study computer science in school is determined by where they grew up, which, which often correlates with their, their race as well. So if you're in a high, uh, high income neighborhood, you're almost twice as likely to have the option to learn computer science in your local school than if you're in a low income neighborhood. And yet, Consider that this is a field that is shown to lead students to outperform. It causes them to enjoy school more. It causes them to be more likely to go to college. And it happens to lead to the best paying jobs in the country. And schools in rich neighborhoods are twice as likely to offer it. So this is ultimately the problem that code.org is trying to solve. We're not trying to get every student to learn to code. We're trying to get every school to teach computer science. And our work is basically changing public education in public schools and traditional, uh, traditional charter schools and even in private schools, getting every school to offer computer science so that the future of this chart shows that 100% of schools teach computer science. We've been doing this work for about six and a half years. Uh, we're now at the point where there's 50 million students globally using the code.org platform. Uh, the largest group of them, roughly 30, to 40, 30 million of them uh, are in the United States. And these students are almost 50% female, almost 50% students of color, and almost 50% too poor to afford lunch, but they're learning computer science in schools. These amazing numbers are successful, not just because of our work, but because we're successfully changing the public education system to add a new subject to the curriculum in a way that hasn't been done before, really in the history of US education. What's also great is that students in our classrooms are just as diverse as their schools. Uh, this is kind of an overwhelming chart, but what this basically plots is on the x-axis is shows how diverse a school is, and on the y-axis is how diverse the code.org classroom is. And so you'd expect if the, if the code.org classroom matched the school diversity, every dot should be on that line. And in fact, most of the dots are on the line, which means uh, Basically, at a school that has a lot of students of color, the code.org classroom matches that school's diversity. At a school that's mostly white, the code.org classroom matches that diversity. In other words, we don't see any issue with uh, racial discrimination in terms of who ends up in the computer science classroom when it's offered at the school the right way. The result of this work is that computer science is exploding in growth among the groups with which it has traditionally had the least representation. So young women taking AP computer science in high school has become the fastest growing course in high schools. Young students of color taking AP computer science as well. Both of these have seen 10x growth in six years. There's, I don't think anything else in education that has grown tenfold in six years, uh, as much as basically representation by women and students of color in computer science. So the movement to, to get computer science in schools has become one of the fastest growing and also least controversial movements in education. Um, I usually show this because it, uh, it looks like a whole bunch of teachers cheering for code.org. This is actually just a rock concert. Um, but what's relevant about it is the number of teachers who've begun teaching using code.org, teaching computer science, is over a thousand times the number of people you see in that picture. Over a million teachers have now begun teaching computer science. This is a teacher-led movement to change education, to make computer science part of the core. 
It's started by individual teachers like Juan Lonzano in, in South Seattle, who brought it to his own classroom and got his whole school to start teaching computer science, which then got the entire district of Highline engaged in teaching computer science, which has now spread to all 50 states having passed laws or changed policies to embrace computer science. So now li literally a global movement where over 50 countries have now taken steps to make computer science part of the school curriculum. Still, we're at a point where most schools don't teach computer science. In, in the United States, we, after six years of work, we're at the point where 45% of schools teach computer science, 55% don't. And as I mentioned earlier, schools in poor neighborhoods are less likely to offer it. The work of code.org, the fundamental way we spend our money is either creating amazing curriculum for teaching computer science or preparing teachers, existing teachers in existing schools to teach this new field. We've now prepared over 100,000 new computer science teachers in seven years. Uh, and these teachers are basically changing the face of education. So for example, in California, we prepared 12,000 new teachers to begin teaching computer science. In New York, there's one and a half million students using code.org and over half of them are in high needs schools. Over half of them are students in, of color. And you know, this is not just in, in big states. In Nebraska, you wouldn't think of that as a tech area but there's almost 4,000 job openings in computing, but only 300 students took the AP computer science exam last year. In Indiana, we prepared 3,000 teachers to teach computer science. In Maine, there's 100,000 students using code.org. Uh, this is basically something that's spanning the entire country. If you're interested in this, if you go to code.org stats, there's a map and you can look up any state and see what is the problem there? What is our impact there? And to see the, the local level at which we're changing education in a country. Um, I want to go back to my own story. You know, when I came to this country as a, as a young immigrant, uh, I had a lot of things going against me. Uh, my family was poor. I was learning a new culture. I was getting comfortable with a new language. Uh, and above all, I really had no idea how to dress for my first day of school. Um, but what I had going for me was a fantastic understanding of computer science and technology. And that has helped me rocket way ahead of my peers and the other students at the, at the schools that I attended. And what I think about is today's students, the ones from the most underprivileged backgrounds, the ones who are least likely to set, be set up for success, what can we do in their schools that in the 21st century most enables them to be successful? If there's this field that is more creative, more engaging, is gets them to help get better at all the subjects they're learning, gets them more likely to go to college, but half of schools don't even offer it. How are we setting those students up for success? The good news is this isn't a problem we can't solve. This is a problem we are solving. And in fact, we're solving it at a record pace. And this is impacting students like Araceli Casillas in South Seattle or Spencer Applegate from a very rural community in, in Kentucky where almost 20% of the students in his school are homeless and he's learning computer programming. Or Katie Clemens in Missouri who wrote an app using code.org to diagnose mental illness to help her fellow students self-diagnose. Young women in Johannesburg, South Africa who are learning computer science. In Popayan in Colombia. Uh, this is a teacher, Flo Vaughn in Oakland where they now teach computer science in every single school in the country. I'm sorry, in the, in the district and really students all around the country and all around the world that are majority women or, or students of color. In a field that has been historically dominated by white men, the students on code.org are 75% women or students of color and are completely changing the face of com computing. This work is basically thanks to one, one and a half million teachers who have begun teaching computer science in their classrooms these teachers themselves didn't know computer science. They didn't study it when they went to college or to high school, uh, but we basically put them through training programs so that the existing teaching workforce of this country can begin teaching computer science in its public schools successfully. And code.org teachers would love your help. Uh, so I would love to take questions, but uh, I would love if anybody's interested in helping with this work, whether at a national level, at a global level, or at a local level, uh, the work that we do is changing education at a record pace uh, in a way that really hasn't been done before in the history of our country, and, it would be, and we can use all the help we can get. Uh, that's it for my presentation, and I'm happy to move to Q&A. And let me stop sharing my screen.
Great. Thank you so much, Hadi, for that presentation and overview. Um, and we'll be sending a follow-up communication following this webinar to everyone who RSVP'd uh, as a way to facilitate one-to-one -one conversations with Hadi and his team, uh, should anyone want to connect uh, individually uh, or have any follow-up questions or, or feedback. Um, so we're, we're happy to facilitate that. Um, I want to, you know, so you obviously gave an overview of Code.org's work, um, you know, absent a pandemic, but also I want to talk maybe a little more about how Code.org has pivoted during the COVID uh, quarantine now that schools are shuttered and uh, kind of getting into what your user data has really revealed, uh, both in terms of inequities, uh, as well as just other trends that, that you're seeing. Sure. Um... The, there's a number of pivots we did. We were fortunate to be relatively early in deciding that, that things have changed. So I think most, most of America decided that things changed, I think, by mid-March. We, by early March, <laughs> two weeks before everybody else decided we, had, we need to start planning for every school to be closed. Uh, and that's partly because we're headquartered in Seattle, which was the sort of the, the first epicenter of this pandemic, uh, sadly. And... This has impacted us quite a bit because code.org is not a distance learning curriculum. It is an in-school program. And our success has been because of teachers teaching computer science in schools. What we've seen at a very real way is that the usage of code.org post pandemic has increased in equity. The numbers that I showed you in terms of the ratios of students on our platform who are students of color or students from poor neighborhoods or students on free and reduced meal plans, those numbers have gotten worse post pandemic, because the, the effectively poorer students don't have connectivity, they don't have devices, or the school system that they go to doesn't have distance learning programs, or the school system out of a desire for equity is basically held off on offering distance learning because they couldn't offer it equitably. And so they said, nobody's going to get it. Um, and this has been really problematic. And it just shows issues and challenges we have in our entire education system with dealing with a pandemic. Uh, the benefit of it is I think it's moved a lot of people to think about how to spend money towards devices, towards connectivity, towards creating it, towards basically bridging the digital divide. Uh, and I think that's gonna have infrastructure investments that this country makes that basically yield years of, of fruit in terms of equity and in terms of access. Now, in terms of specifics of what we've done, one of the more interesting things we did, and this was a very fast moving thing, we basically decided that if our schools can't teach computer science in an equitable way to students while, while schools are closed, we'll directly offer our own distance learning offering. Uh, so we launched this thing called Code Break. Uh, and Code Break is a one hour, a week, one hour a week class where I personally am teaching together with special guests who come on. And it's something that any student in the world can join. It's a live classroom. Uh, and it's not a classroom that you need a computer to participate in. You can even do it on a smartphone. And there's students that join this live classroom from as far west as Hawaii, where it's 7 a.m. in their morning, all the way to Malaysia or China, where they're tuning in at 1 a.m. <laughs> in the middle of their night uh, on smartphones, tablets, and computers. And the special guests we've had on the show have been really amazing. We've had folks like uh, Mark Cuban or Ashton Kutcher and other celebrities. We've had the founder of Instagram or even Bill Gates come teaching computer science to these kids in a live format. Uh, and it's interactive, which makes it really fun. For example, when Mark Cuban came on Code Break, we had students pitch him on app ideas. We'd had the entire audience of 10,000 students vote which idea like they liked the most. And then my team and I taught in real time how to build that app. And then we pushed the app to the entire audience so they have it on their phones uh, at the end of one hour. So uh, we've been really innovating in what you can do with distance learning and uh, having a giant classroom that is live and interactive at a time when our schools are still struggling to figure it out. Wow, really, really raising the bar with guest lecturers. I mean, that's that's great. Um, I want I want to uh, ask some about something specific. I, mean, I want to answer. Camila answer asked: Are the code break sessions only in English? And sadly, they are only in English. Although uh, there's a Televisa Fundacion in Mexico has been talking with us about recreating the same thing in, in Spanish. For basically the for all of Spanish speaking Americas. Great, that's that's helpful. Um, I before we get into more questions, I see they're they're coming in. Um, I did want to ask you about we have a number of donors on this webinar who support charter schools, and you participated in 
a, uh, a similar Zoom call with the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools where you, you revealed some findings that you were kind of surprised by given charters uh, priding themselves on innovation and, and trying to be ahead of the curve. Would you mind just uh, maybe sharing with donors uh, what those were and maybe how they can be a little more proactive? Yeah, it was shocking to me. Uh, the graph I showed you earlier about where computer science is taught and where it's equitably taught or not, it's similar in equity where students at charter schools are half as likely to have access to computer science in their schools than students at traditional public schools. Traditional public schools are twice as likely to teach computer science than charter schools. If you'd asked almost anybody in education, they would, they would guess that it's the opposite because charter schools are known for innovation. They're known for leading the way and for, for trying new things. Uh, now, the reason for this is twofold. One reason is charter schools tend to be in poorer neighborhoods and computer science is less available in poorer neighborhoods. So it's just part of the trend of uh, lower income neighborhoods are less likely to teach computer science. But the reason for this is because the work of code.org has historically focused on traditional public schools. We've worked with all of the largest school districts, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Oakland, Broward County, uh, Clark County, all of the largest public school districts use code.org as their program to teach computer science. And we haven't historically worked with charter schools as a real sort of push. And that's something that we're now starting. In fact, we established a partnership with KIPP. KIPP schools is teaching with code.org as their curriculum of choice and as their teacher preparation program of choice. And we're partnering with them to basically invite uh, any charter school that wants to also teach computer science to work with us to participate in the training program we're doing with KIPP. Great, that, that's helpful. And then just my last question, I'll leave it here for now and then we'll get into some more. But piggybacking on that, um, that idea of partnering with schools and partnering with networks, what is the donor role here, both as it relates to um, you know, leveraging partnerships, whether it's with code.org and, and schools, um, how do you see the philanthropic role within the, both the work of code.org as well as just normalizing computer science as a regular part of education? That's a great question. I'd start by saying my goal isn't to have code.org in every school, to have computer science offered in every school. And if I succeed at convincing the world that that's important, even if it's not with code.org, uh, the world will end up being a better place. We happen to be the most cost effective, most popular, and I believe among the highest quality ways computer science could be taught in schools. Uh, we're not, but we're not the only way. And if any donor is passionate about this and helps convince a school district or a charter network to teach computer science, whether it's with code.org or not, this movement is, is, goes further. Now we happen to be the primary that people end up doing this work and we've established over 60 different local partnerships so in any region in the country, there's a local organization such as the Idaho Digital Learning Academy or the Next Tech nonprofit in Indiana uh, or CODA in Virginia. These local nonprofits, some, sometimes they're actually a university department, are in partnership with code.org. And those local organizations are doing the work in their region to basically help schools teach computer science. And we actually help fund those local organizations we train those local people on how to spread computer science in the schools, and they're doing the actual uh, work on the ground. So if a donor wants to get involved, there's many different ways. Uh, one way could be if, you, if your passion is local, you can help fund the local partner of code.org to train teachers locally. And the metrics of success you get from that are basically how many new schools began teaching computer science, what were the student results in those schools, what are the demographics of the students, and so on or you could fund code.org as, as a national level. And one thing that's really about the work that we do, whether with our local partners or directly, is we are very, very metrics oriented. Um, you know, I, before I started doing this, I started dabbling in, in basically making financial gifts to education nonprofits. And one thing that struck me was I never knew what happened with my money. Uh, I like, I knew how much money I gave, but I didn't know what the results were. Uh, and code.org does a, pretty good job of telling you, you gave this much, this many teachers went through training, this many students learned computer science. These are AP exam scores broken up by, by you know, demographics, by gender and race. Um, we are, it is very, very unusual in education to have that level of metrics. Um, we, we know when we train a teacher 
how many students they go into to their class, demographics of their students are, and we map it, map it all the way back to test results of the AP exam. So, uh, and one of the reasons we do that is because we want to prove that we have an extremely high return on investment. So for example, it costs us less than $50 per student that takes a college level exam and a college level course in computer science. Um, you know, if you think about the tuition for a course in college, it's way more than $50. The reason $50 with us gives a student that education is because the school system pays the cost of the teacher's salary, the computers, the building, et cetera. And uh, we just pay the cost of training the teacher and the cost of providing them a, a curriculum. And, and we're effectively changing education in a very cost-effective way. That's great. And really gets at the point of um, making it accessible to all kids and, and clearing this misconception that coding comp sci is for, as you said, the math nerds earlier, but also just, you know, maybe kids quote unquote gifted or in advanced placement courses when really, you know, the, these courses are available to the, at the elementary level all the way on up um, where it's not as, it shouldn't have this mark of exclusivity that it's often maybe attached. Um, well, great. And so we have, we've had some, a few questions come in. Uh, one from Jeannie Kreth, what are some of the biggest obstacles you've experienced trying to get computer science into schools? There's, yeah, he asks three questions. Uh, we can go through all of them. So the biggest obstacles, um, by far the biggest obstacle is people's mindset, especially the mindset of administrators. Uh, basically, administrators think it's not something my students are going to be able to learn my teachers aren't going to want to do it. And their mindset is more about like, let's, let me just keep running my school the way it's been run. This is not an easy job. Uh, if you ask teachers, the majority of teachers think every student must be required to learn computer science. And if you ask, it's one of their favorite things to learn. But the administrators aren't super connected to that. And they tend to have the stereotype that this is for the students who know math. This is for the students who want to go into, into tech jobs. And so they think of it as like, maybe 5% of my students would care about this. Uh, understanding that computer science is just as foundational as biology, that it's more fun than most of the things in school, and that young women and students of color can outperform at it, and that it's linked more to language skills than to math skills. The, the stereotypes are by far the biggest obstacle. Uh, People think that computer availability or connectivity is an obstacle that hasn't been an obstacle other than in rural neighborhoods uh, where shortage of, you know, internet connectivity has been a problem. In outside of rural, most schools have enough computers and a good enough bandwidth to be able to teach computer science. Uh, funding is always also an issue, but we're at a point where code.org is subsidizing this work. So for most schools, uh, most schools don't need to pay anything to teach computer science, either because we're giving it away to them for free or because their states will pay them to do it because of the work that we've done to get states to provide funding streams for this. For example, in Texas, Texas has decided that per student who takes computer science, they'll pay more per to, to the school. The school gets extra funding per student enrolled in computer science programs. So funding is not only not an obstacle, it's actually a, a carrot. Uh, but the stereotypes are by far the hardest obstacle. Interesting. Um, and then just uh, following up on the last, the, another couple of questions here. How do you get quote unquote time into the curriculum and does code.org have competitors? Sure. Um, getting time in the curriculum is a challenge, but it's not a challenge we can't overcome. Uh, and this is basically the school day is limited. There's only so much we can teach our kids. What can we do in the limited time we have uh, at the high school level? The way I think about this and the way schools have now come around to think about this is, you know, students get to choose from a menu of math courses and from a menu of science courses. Not everybody is required to take the exact same science courses or the exact same math courses. As long as computer science is on that menu and students and it counts towards graduation as a math or science course, it's at least equitable in terms of students have the chance to take it. And if they take it, it counts towards graduation. And if, we, if you do that, the time and the schedule is actually chosen by the students. All the school needs to do is make it available on the calendar. Uh, in K through eight, uh, it's not nearly as simple because students don't get to choose what classes they take in, in third grade or fourth grade. Uh, but what turns out is most of K through eight has enough tech time 
or sort of basically in, in middle school, there's a tech class in most middle schools and the current tech classes are really out of date. They teach things like how to browse the web or you know how to do a search on the internet. And back in the 1990s, that was something that got put into schools. These days, the student and the teacher are like wondering why am I learning to browse the web? I learned that when I was you know, much, much younger than, than eighth grade. And so those tech classes are being revamped to become computer science classes. In elementary school, computer science doesn't need to fight for time because you can't teach second graders or fourth graders math and reading over and over every single hour of the day. You need to sort of alternate with you know, a little bit of math, a little bit of fun, a little bit of reading, a little bit of fun. Like if you, if you think about seven-year-old or eight-year-old kids, they're not learning like a hard skill like six hours in a row. And computer science actually ends up being the fun. We regularly hear from teachers that they use code.org in their class and say, uh, you know, you can't do the coding until you finish your math. So it's not like they don't think of it as finding time for, for computer science. They think of it as creating a motivator for the other subjects. Do you, yeah. do you, do you hear something similar at, now that during COVID with, um, you know, obviously at the, particularly at the elementary level when, you know, you kind of need to stagger things a little more, uh, you know, the, the full school day isn't necessarily um, there right now when, when kids are at home. Have you heard anything to that effect uh, in terms of how does computer science now factor in uh, with, the, with other subjects that may be taught at, at home? Among how the school feels about it, sadly, the school thinks of it as more optional and that's depressing. And the reason for that is I think because schools teach the same stuff they've been teaching for the last 200 years and computer science is the new thing. And so even though they want students to learn, if they want to learn to teach the basics, most people don't think of computer science as one of the basics. I personally think that's a mistake. If you think how the students react to it, the students are much more excited about computer science. In fact, we regularly get posts on social media, people writing in about their students during this period learning to code because they want to, which is not how they're treating a lot of the other stuff that they're doing with school. So, you know, parents are posting photos of their, their young girls coding at midnight on code.org. Uh, they're like, I, I want my kids to go to sleep, but I'm pretty excited that they're learning to code. So they get to stay up. That's, that's not the sort of normal reaction school work. You don't see posts about young girls learning math at midnight uh, because most of, most of school doesn't feel fun and creative, whereas computer science is naturally creative. That's, that's great. Um, we've had a couple of questions as to availability of, of the PowerPoint that Hadi shared. Yes, uh, we will be able to share that information. Um, we'll send a follow up. Like I said earlier, we'll send a follow up email with some key takeaways uh, with, you know, Hadi and his team uh, CC'd on that where, you know, anyone can really follow up uh, if, if they're looking for more information or, or to have those one to one discussions. Um, I see here we have another question that just came through. Oh, just a comment of just the importance of community-based organizations, um, which which you alluded to as as really a point of entry uh, for code.org into both schools and communities, uh, which is great. Um, I want to, you know, if if there are no other questions, I wanted to maybe just get a little macro here and just uh, and talk about just how um, just your view, Hadi, on how um, code.org's work functions now in this new age uh in you know this new era where we're under we're under quarantine and even when we come back out um there's going to be a new normal when it comes to schooling and um how we really view things um how do you see code.org kind of rolling with those changes um and and where the future is sure um there's a number of things that help us and some that hurt us the thing that hurts us is the stereotype that this is an optional thing and it's not part of the basics uh, and it's a mindset shift that we need really all adults to, to, to think about. Kids think of technology as part of the basics. If you try to take technology away from students, they, they'll kick and scream and they don't like it to be taken away from them. But the adults think of it as sort of an optional thing and they think the basics is, is math or science or social studies and all those things are basics, but computer science deserves to be in there. Um, the things that help us uh, or the, the ways that we have some strengths during this time of pandemic. One is that all of the materials on code.org are already online. That doesn't mean you need to be in front of a screen to study them. 
roughly half of our curriculum is uh, unplugged activities that can be without a computer, but at least the material is already online. They're not in a physical book. Uh, you know, a lot of them aren't delivered by a lecture. If there's any lectures on code.org are delivered as YouTube videos that a student could watch at home rather than, than watching in the classroom. Uh, the other thing that helps us is uh, students are naturally motivated to do the work of, on, in computer science and on code.org more so than in any other subjects. Uh, it is a lot easier to convince a student to, to create their own game or create their own web page or create their own digital story than to convince them to do basically homework in most other subjects. And so at a time when you're not forced to do it because you're in a classroom, but it's more like your, your mom or dad is telling you that you need to do this for school, code.org is a lot more fun to do than a lot of other things. Uh, and it's not just because it's got creativity, we make it extra fun. So we've, you know, we've gone through this extra effort to get things like, you know, um, we have lectures that are drip, that are spoken to you by rock stars or athletes who also learn computer science and they're the ones lecturing. And it's kind of cool to see, you know, the guy who wrote a song talking about how his music is digitally compressed and how compression works. Uh, or when you're coding on code.org, sometimes you're creating an app, but sometimes you're writing the code for R2D2 to find its way to the fighter pilots that he's trying to save. And Princess Leia is cheering you on to write that code. And if you're like a nine-year-old kid and you're trying to decide, should I write the code for R2D2 or should I you know, answer a multiple choice question on a sort of study guide, the, the R2D2 thing is a lot more fun. Um, so those types of things are really helping us during the pandemic. No, 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 no greater motivator than Princess Leia. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of Star Wars fans out there. Uh, well, that's that's great. Um, I think I don't see any more questions that came in. Hadi, anything we missed? Any anything? Uh, you know, we obviously talked about the donor role earlier a little bit, um, but a anything that you, you, maybe you um, we forgot to mention here? There's a question from Jeannie that I wanted to get back to from Jeannie. Oh, Kraft. Sure. Um, she asked, "Do you have any competitors?" Oh, right. My apologies. I. I, because my goal is computer science being offered in every school, any way that that happens, I view that as a success. So any organization that is working towards that, I don't think of them as a competitor. I think of them really as a co-conspirator or part of the same movement. So what I truly personally think of as competition is the inertia of how school works uh, and the inertia of people's mindsets that you know, the things we should teach in school are the same things that we taught 200 years ago. Uh, but there are many other organizations that work in computer science. There's none that is at the scale of what code.org is doing in the United States across creating curriculum, creating a coding platform, training teachers, and changing state policies. We're the only organization that does all of those things across all 50 states. Uh, but there's lots of other organizations working on this, and we think of them as partners. And in fact, if somebody funds another organization working on this. On the one hand, we'd be bummed not to have that, those funds to put to great use with the, the great return on investment we get. But on the other hand, it's still solving the same ultimate problem, perhaps a different way. And we're, we're very uh, happy to be part of a, a, a large movement. So we're a big player in this movement, but we're not the only player. Absolutely. And, and really one of the reasons I wanted, we wanted to feature code.org uh, to the Roundtable Network is not only were you slated to speak uh, at our national forum, but just really the nimbleness with which code.org has adapted uh, to, to the pandemic and, and kids having to shelter um, and, you know, and not being able to attend a school. So, so thank you for, for the work you've been doing and what you're going to be doing. Uh, I think uh, we'll leave it there uh, for now. Like I said, uh, we'll send some follow. We'll send a follow-up note with with requisite contact info, PowerPoint slides, as well as any other relevant info to encourage as much follow-up as possible. Um, with that, Hadi, thank you so much for t participating, um, and let us know uh, if there's anything else that we can provide. All right. Thank you so much, and again, uh, thank you for hosting me and for, for for the opportunity to give the presentation. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Stay safe. Yep. Bye now.